Anyways, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the talk by uh, Chandler McCoy from Getty Conservation Institute. Before going further uh, with introductions, I want to take this opportunity to talk a little about the Center for Heritage Conservation at SEPT. Uh, one of the reasons to talk about it is that it has been exactly one year since we started it. So la in January 2019 is when we uh, announced, officially announced that we have a center that's going to work on uh, research and advocacy around conservation, and we are one year in it. In that process, we've done few research projects, but we've, I think, built a lot of relationships in terms of uh, conservation research happening around the work and conservation uh, around the world and conservation advocacy around the world and one such relationship is with uh, Getty Conservation Institute and I'm very glad that um, Chandler is here and he's agreed to do this talk while he was in India. Uh, Chandler McCoy manages the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative at Getty Conservation Institute. Uh, whose mission is to advance the practice of conserving modern heritage. He is an alum of University of Virginia, Columbia University, and has done his conservation from Ikrom, Rome. Uh, today he will be speaking about the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative efforts to advance knowledge in the field. I welcome Chandler. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming to my lecture and happy anniversary for your heritage program. Um, I've been asked to talk a bit about, to explain what the Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative is and what projects we've been working on. And further to, to sort of explain why we're doing it. Um, the Getty Conservation Institute is a private international research institute dedicated to advancing conservation practice throughout the world. The Getty has, uh, Conservation Institute, or the GCI as we call it, has been around since 1987. And f for most of those 30 years, it has been working in, in very traditional fields within the conservation world. We work in um, the Mediterranean world, conserving classical mosaics, or we've been working in the um, the Valley of the Kings, conserving the tomb of King Tut, or the Valley of the Queens, we're about to start on Nefertari's tomb. We've been working in China, conserving uh, wall paintings in Dunhuang. So th they have, they've had a, v a long track record of a very sort of traditional approach to conservation and really looking at antiquities. And um, this uh, conservation of modern architecture is a fairly new idea then for the Getty. It's a bit of a divergence from the more traditional approach and therefore um, it's, it's new and a lot of people are still wondering why we're doing it. So I'm going to answer some of those, those questions. Um, the reason that we're looking at modernism and the reason that it's a sort of a separate initiative is because modern heritage has its own particular sets of issues. And I'm going to describe those. First of all, there's the, the issue of quantity. Um, there's m lots and lots of modern architecture and um, all around the world. In, in the United States, it said that 85% of the buildings in the US were built after the Second World War, so post-1945. That's a lot of buildings. And these modern buildings also are in a, of a scale that was never uh, known before. Vast housing estates and skyscrapers and airports and buildings that didn't even exist in the 19th century. And, and so there's something about not only the amount of modern architecture, but the scale um, that makes us r realize that we need to understand how to, how to deal with these buildings as, as they get older. And because they have their own set of issues, um, they have technical challenges. Many times the modern structures were uh, experimental, either in their construction techniques or in the materials that were used. Um, frequently we see these composite structural systems like reinforced concrete or brick reinforced with steel. Um, they pose their own challenges. And we, we find that there are limited repair techniques and there isn't a very 
um, a robust industry that knows how to deal with these kind of issues when it comes time to repair buildings from this, this era. I'm, mostly when I'm speaking about modern, modern architecture, I'm talking about works from the 1920s through the 1970s. That's a sort of broad category, maybe goes later in, in, the, in some countries. And I mean, in the US, we, did, we had a, a little bit of modernism at, in the mid 20s. In Europe, it started earlier. But this is generally the, the period that I'm talking about um, that, we, that we now call the modern era. And one of the things about m modern buildings is that they have a different lifespan than traditional buildings. In um, this writer named Thomas Thorne, had done a study, he was a, a British writer, he'd done a study of these traditional um, you know, mortar and stone houses and, uh, or buildings of any type that came up with this rule of thumb that every building needed, of these traditional buildings, they needed their first major renovation after about 120 years. And so there was this cycle of repair you know, that could be pretty much anticipated these old buildings are durable and they're dependable and um, they tend to last. In the case of modern architecture, we don't actually, we can't really quantify what the lifespan is. Um, it certainly isn't 120 years. I was, I was out at the I, IIM this morning where they've just completed a very major renovation of their library and they're going to then move on to the administration block. They've spent some 2.3 million rupees on this building. It was built in 1974. It's a, it isn't even 50 years old, and it's already had to have a significant major um, renovation. So this is what we're up against when we're looking at the way modern materials age, the way these composite systems um, deteriorate. So. It can be a, quite a problem. I know that you're addressing that very problem here at SEPT. There are other challenges. One of them is the specificity of these forms. Um, you've probably heard this modern adage, form follows function. And in a lot of buildings from the modern era, they were purpose built. They were built to be airpl airpl airplane terminals or train sheds or or, or something, and it's very difficult to modify these buildings. In the slides I'm showing, the building at the top was the TWA terminal at JFK Airport in New York by Aero Sarin, and the one in the middle is an office building by Frank Lloyd Wright, and the one at the bottom is the Prentice Hospital in Chicago. The Prentice Hospital was torn down because they said it is impossible to renovate it because it's this very strange cloverleaf Plan. So there's modern buildings, and in fact, the nice story about the TWA terminal, it, it could no longer serve as an airplane terminal because the technology of you know, air travel has changed so much, but it was, it was designated as a landmark in New York, and they turned it into the hotel lobby, and then they built hotel rooms around it, and now it's been reborn as an airport hotel. And so the, these buildings are extremely challenging, or they can be. Uh, it takes a lot of ingenuity sometimes to figure out uh, how to save a building like this and reuse it. So with all of these challenges, um, the, the Getty decided uh, to, to, to launch this Conserving Modern Architecture initiative. Their first step was we assembled a, a a symposium of experts, people working around the world in this field, people from organizations like Docomomo or Ikomo's 20th Century, uh, people who've been in this practice and specialize. And we basically ask them, where are the gaps in, in this field? You as a practitioner, and we're focusing on architects and conservators who are out there doing the work, uh, we ask them, what 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 are the gaps that we could fill? How could we be useful to provide information that, that you need? And from this uh, originate, originating symposium, we developed a, these four pillars, we call them, which is scientific research, 
um, model field projects, education and training, dissemination of resources, and public programming. And so this is what the CMAI is all about, and we're trying to do something in each of these areas. The CMAI was launched in 2012, so it's now been seven years. So we have a few things to talk about that we've actually uh, completed since since then, but we're no by no means finished. It's sort of an it's a it's a big and challenging undertaking that we've uh, committed to. Uh, we st we have these field projects wh where we partner with a building owner and we provide technical expertise. We don't do construction projects or fund the projects, but we provide our expertise in, a, in a, an attempt to, to do useful work that we can then share with other people that they can learn from. Our field projects have been the Eames House in California and the Salk Institute for Biological Studies by Louis Kahn, which is in San Diego, California, and then just recently the Chandigarh Government Art Museum. The project was just launched last week, which is why I'm in India. Um, for that. I'll talk about all of those. Uh, first, the Eames House. That's been our longest running um, field project. We started working with the Eames Foundation in 2012. Now, the Eames House is the house of Charles and Ray Eames. Um, Charles died in 1978, and Ray, his wife, died in 88, and it's been turned into a house museum. Um, you may know that the Charles and Ray Eames have a connection to Ahmedabad. They were invited by Nehru to come to India to develop concepts for the National Institute for Design, and they stayed here in Ahmedabad, and they traveled extensively in India, and at the end of this stay here, they wrote this, this thing called the India Report, which was very useful in forming the design school. And they brought a lot of things back from India with them. They traveled, they were, I think, quite influenced by India. Um, so the house is a kind of a, a, t a, repre or a testament to, to them. It's open to the public, and it's pretty much left just as they, as they had. You see this photograph taken in the 50s. Um, this is a steel house. Uh, I'll change slides here. It's a steel and glass house. It was very innovative at the time. They were attempting to solve a, a, a housing shortage with a, with a low cost solution, which is using what were basically factory components, but no one had ever really put steel and glass like this together as a residential um, design before. Um, and it's, it's quite a fragile house, actually. So they, they, they came to us and they asked us if we could provide them with some assistance. And so over the years, we've been helping them on various things. They're a family organization, so they don't have a lot of expertise in this field. And um, so we began by doing some scientific investigations. We did some paint analysis the, in, in a building like this, which is so minimal. The colors are really very important, and there was quite a bit of discussion about whether these black steel pieces were originally black. And we felt it was important to do color studies and do a paint stratigraphy and a, a, a sort of attach a chronology to these layers of paint so we could understand when they were applied. We did some work on an interior wood lining uh, and to identify the wood species and there was staining and we were able to clean it and help them with that. Um, we did an en environmental monitoring project very similar to what I'm about to tell you about. Um, in Chandigarh we set up monitors for temperature, humidity, uh, we looked at UV and visible light and pollution and insects and we monitored the house for several years and then came up with a report to recommend how they could um, make changes to the house. It was designed with a very typical residential heating system and now it's a museum and the things that they had in their house which were just their everyday objects, although they had some very nice everyday objects um, and they had collections of art and things. They, these, this is now considered a museum collection. So we need, it needs to be taken care of at a slightly higher standard. And it's a lot of the things in this collection are very fragile. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that. So um, we also did a number of things related to the site. We did a landscape survey. We looked at the condition of the trees. We did a geotechnical report. 
the improvements plan I just mentioned, and we're working on uh, the exterior uh, paneling system. This is a product called Semesto. This is one of these experimental 20th century materials I mentioned. It's a it's a sandwich board. It's a uh, about one inch thick with a cement asbestos layer and some fiber board on the middle. And they used it to fill in sections of this window wall system wherever they wanted an opaque wall. In the US and in a lot of places, asbestos is now banned. So this is no longer made. And people are think it's highly toxic and are very afraid of it. It is not, it's not hazardous in this condition. It's actually in fairly good condition, but it isn't made anymore. So we're trying to see if there are some replacement materials and we're trying to develop treatment strategies to repair uh, this material and try to consolidate the interior core because if we can, if we can, we want to preserve as much of it as possible. Um, and so we're going to, when I get back, we're going to do some consolidant testing and so forth and do some field trials and try to find a, a good solution. Um, this is one of these products that is used extensively and nobody has really done any research about what you do about this. And um, it's, it's better if we can just leave it and repair it than replace it. So that's our goal. Um, the biggest single thing that we've done for the Eames House is we've, um, we've written a conservation management plan that we, uh, that we published in, in January of 2019 after many years. And uh, we're, the Getty is a very big proponent of conservation management plans. I'm happy to see you're doing one here for, for SEPT. Um, it is, a, uh, it is a, a, a sort of a methodology and a document type that isn't that common in the US. It's very common in Australia, common in England, sort of based on the Borough Charter in a way. The methodology that it uses is based on the Borough Charter. So the Getty is a big proponent of this type of this methodology. And the conservation management plan is a, is a tool that the building owners can use for making decisions. It's a, it, as you see here, this is the table of contents. It does a very thorough historical uh, review. It, it assesses the condition of the building. Uh, it compares it with other buildings of its, of its time. And all of this is done in order to develop a an understanding of what's significant about it. And then after its significance has been identified, uh, these conservation policies are developed in order to support the significance that we've identified. And um, so I'm going to talk a bit about, about this. And uh, I, I have actually uh, brought a copy of this with me, which I gave to Professor Desai. So maybe you'll put that in the conservation library or something like that. Um, one of the things about the Eames House that we uh, realized when we started working on it is it isn't just a, a building, but it's a building in a landscape with a collection inside it. And th this building had already been listed as a, a national landmark in the US, but most of all of the, and it had been listed as Los Angeles monument, but everybody just looked at it as a piece of architecture. And because of the sort of fame of Charles and Ray Eames, you know, the, the association with them and the architecture was all that people really identified. And we realized that that wasn't the full story at all. The house was sitting on a, a large parcel that looked out over the Pacific with a row of uh, eucalyptus trees that, that predated the house with an open meadow. Um, and that was a very important part of the house. And the things that were inside the house were equally important. They, they were avid collectors. They traveled, as I mentioned. Um, they had works of art. They had works of their own furniture and their own textiles in the house. And um, so everything within the house was just as important in a way. It was, if, that, if those things were not in the house, um, the house would lose a huge amount of its character and its association with the two of them. So we felt that we had to look at these three things, and we identified these three things as the sort of the the underpinning of what made the building significant. significant. So we looked at the building complex. There are um, two separate, let me see here, 
there, there's a, the residence here, and then there's the studio with the central courtyard and open space. So even the outdoor space associated with the building were part, part of the architecture and uh, had a sort of character. And you can see in this picture the courtyard, the planted courtyard with the paving, all of those things were part of it. So just to say this is a work of architecture, we thought that was a very short-sighted approach uh, and it needed to be expanded. And then the, um, the building sits on this sort of wedge-shaped site up on a bluff. It has these landscape elements like this wooden pathway and this row of trees and this open meadow and all of these l landscape features are just as important and def in defining the significance of the place. And then, as I said, the, the contents of the house is a really interesting collection of, of personal items and their design work. And um, we felt it, in, it was vital to identify this as part of the CMP. And then, um, so the way the CMP policies work, as I say, they are geared to the significance so that the policies will, will guide the Eames Foundation or whoever is managing the place. Um, they have very general topics like governance and implementation planning and maintenance and just basic things. Uh, to guide the organization, and then the, we provide very detailed policies as well. And in the detailed policies, we go into you know roof and drainage repair and reinforced concrete slabs and all of the different materials and uh, items that make elements that make up the building. And there are detailed policies for maintaining the collection and detailed policies for managing the landscape. Um, so as I said, this, I brought a copy of this and, and have a look if you're interested. And um, then all of the scientific reports that we did have been published and we put everything online on our website. Um, I mentioned that one of, the dis one of the pillars was dissemination. So whenever we do a project, we don't do it just for the, f the benefit of the Eames Foundation, but we try to publish these things and make our work uh, available so that other people can learn from it. I mean, our feeling is that we have the ad advantage of doing projects in a way that, that um, can produce good learnings and lessons for other people. And um, so we try our best to make these available. Uh, there's a lot of material on our website that you can download. and. Um, such as the Eames CMP, that's a, a PDF that you can download if you want to see it. So the, uh, the second field project that we did was the Salk Institute for Biological Studies by Louis Kahn, who is also the architect of the IIM here. Uh, there's some similarities in terms of the way the buildings are massed, although this is a building made of reinforced concrete and teak. So they came to the Salk Institute um, is a scientific research institute, and they came to us uh, asking for help with, with preservation of the teak. And these window walls are a key part of the, the architecture, and they had been badly stained. There was a black biofilm growing on them, and they were deteriorating, and they had been, this black biofilm developed very early on, and Louis Kahn didn't want to put any kind of a sealant or treatment and this dark film appeared and the, the weathering was happening irregularly and Jonas Salk, who was the head of this center, didn't like that and they started putting uh, stains and coatings and then they would fail and they had a funny orange appearance. And uh, anyway, after about 40 years, the teak looked pretty terrible and the institute wanted to just throw it all away. We just have to replace all this teak and they wanted us to, actually I think they came to us and said, do you know a place where we can get old growth teak or reclaimed teak or something? And we said, wait a minute, let's see if we can preserve what's here. And um, I mean teak is an endangered wood and it isn't that easy to just replace. So we did about a year's worth of um, testing to discover what it was. The biofilm was caused by eucalyptus trees nearby. It wasn't actually damaging the wood, we determined, but it was 
unsightly. It was creating this black staining. We figured out how it could be cleaned. We tested a number of coatings, clear coatings that could be applied. Um, and we, were, we looked at the original drawings, realized some of the detailing had been changed on site at the last minute, so the building wasn't doing a very good job of shedding water. It actually had termites had gotten into this uh, wood, wooden assembly, into the, the soft wood behind the teak. Um, so it, we developed a series of recommendations for them to um, make repairs, and in the end, they were able to keep 75% of the original teak and only had to discard 25% of it. And in the process, we taught them something about our conservation ethic and our conservation methodology. And I mean, to us, people like me who are architects who love modern architecture, that is a icon of architecture and they they knew that like they knew there were always architects coming to see the building but they didn't really understand that meant something about the way they should take care of it and i think we feel like in addition to f solving the teak problem we shared some important lesson with them about taking care of the building and um, there again if you're interested in very technical things and looking at slides of a wood under a microscope. This is online. This is a phase, there's phase one and a phase two. These are the project reports that talk about this work that we did. So um, the third project is one fairly close to us. It's in Chandigarh in, um, in the state of Punjab. And I've just returned from, uh, I was just there for a week and we've just, we're doing an environmental, uh, analysis similar to what we did at the Eames House. So this is a, a, a museum by Le Corbusier that contains a very important collection. And the collection is very linked with the story of the founding of, of Chandigarh when the um, partition happened and the state of Punjab was sort of split between Pakistan and India. There was a very important museum in Lahore um, that was one of the five, I think there were like five museums that the British had, uh, that had established and it contained a very important collection. So they actually split the collection too and 60% of it stayed in Lahore and 40% of it came here. And when Le Corbusier was designing this building, he didn't know that this was going to be happening. I mean, no one knew that the partition would no, he did know the, about the partition, but the collection, it took a while to get here, and he thought he was, he was just sort of designing an art museum. And I'll talk a bit about this museum uh, because it's quite an interesting piece of architecture as well. But um, the building dates from 1968, and um, it holds this collection, which includes uh, important Indian miniatures from the uh, Pahari, Pahari uh, region. It includes Gandhara sculptures from north of pa northern Pakistan, and, and um, it in has a very important collection of uh, historic coins as well, and tech some textiles. So, important collection, important building, and um, these uh, the the Chandigarh Government Museum received a grant from the Getty Foundation to do a CMP, and we decided we would work with them to develop this environmental piece because the building doesn't um, work very well. It, it was designed with the sort of open, uh, if you know the Sanskar Kendra, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's, this is the sister museum. It has a central courtyard. It's raised on piloti. And, um, and over the years, they've made a lot of changes. Uh, it's a beautiful museum, but it was more or less designed to be naturally ventilated. And um, it's lit from above by these monitors that allow light coming in um, to light the gallery spaces. But over the years, they've air conditioned parts of it and they have closed there these vertical aerators that were allowed, that were designed to let, to let wind and uh, cool breezes in. They've closed those because of an early theft problem that made them extremely security conscious. So they've made changes to it over the years that have actually um, prevented this sort of natural ventilation. And I, I don't know that Le Corbusier was 
always successful when he tried to design these things, but he, he tried. I mean, he thought about the climate. I don't think he completely understood it, but he had an intention that the building could be cooled in the summer by natural breezes, and now it doesn't work at all, and apparently it gets so hot that people don't even come to the museum at all in August. And so we're going to look at, we've set up uh, temperature relative humidity monitors throughout the building. We're monitoring UV and visible light. We're putting, we've got a pollution monitor inside the building. We put a weather station on the top of the building and these little coupons inside the display cases. So we're going to try to understand over the course of a full year what, how the building behaves in the climate that it has. And, and we're gonna to try to make suggestions for improving that to the benefit of both the collection and to the people who visit and to the people who work there. So uh, it's a combination of looking at the collection and the, the architecture and trying to come up with solutions that will um, hopefully be able to reinstate some of the original principles of this building and also uh, d protect the collection. Um, there's a very interesting element to this building. I should go back. Wait, no, the next one. The, uh, look, as I said, Le Corbusier didn't know what the collection was going to be, and he just, they wanted an art museum in Chandigarh, and sector 10 was the cultural sector, so he designed this museum. And it wasn't until after he, um, he died uh, accidentally in 1964 um, that they solidified that they would get this Lahore collection. And every room is a, a sort of the same, very tall space, and yet they're displaying these Indian miniatures, which are quite you know, intimate scenes that you have to get very close to. So they hired an, an Italian Indian designer named Ratna Fabri, and she designed this casework, and um, it's actually quite beautiful, and we think it's a significant, it is an element of significance for the building. I mean, there's the Le Corbusier architecture, there's the collection, but there's also this display. Um, now, some of them aren't working very well, but we're going to try to see how we can keep some of this. Um, some of it is really quite beautiful. She was trying to create more intimate spaces and uh, display the sculptures in the round so people could see them. And, um, so that's another aspect of this museum that we consider to be significant. Okay, so in terms of research, uh, we're doing research on concrete, and that's been our that's our big focus right now. Obviously, concrete is one of the building blocks of the modern era. Uh, you have issues with concrete here. Everybody has issues with concrete, and um, some of the research that we're we've just started is to look at patch repairs that have been done over the past 25 years. People have been repairing concrete for the last 25 years, but nobody has ever actually gone back to look at the efficacy of those repairs to make a determination about what works and what doesn't. So we're working with a partner in uh, the Heritage uh, Historic England and um, this laboratory in France and some partners in the US uh, there'll be 10 case study sites picked in each of the three countries, so there'll be 30 sites, and we'll analyze with this criteria that we developed uh, how these different types of patch repairs have worked, and hopefully come up with some results that will, able, will guide us to doing a better job in the future. And um, then the next phase of this is we're going to look at these mortar formulations that are used for patching. Um, companies uh, sell these products and sometimes they're these proprietary products and you don't exactly know what they are and they're purported to be the perfect solution for every problem and we're going to do some analysis about commonly used uh, repair products. In addition, we're writing something called concrete conservation principles, which will be a simple set of a guide, like a two or three page document that will help people understand how to do concrete uh, repair from what we feel is like the best practices that we've observed. This is a peer reviewed document that we're hoping to come, the peer review has, has been done and we're hoping to print it by the end of this year. 
So this should just be a sort of handy guide to people who are in a uh, situation where you're about to do some concrete conservation and there's some basic principles. Um, I see that you have already received a copy of, a, of this concrete book. We're also doing a series of um, case study books and each volume of the case study book is going to be a different topic that will be uh, of interest to people in the conservation field. The first topic uh, that we chose was concrete, as I said, basic building block uh, and, and, a, and an area where we definitely heard that people want to learn about. This building contains 14 case studies from different places around the world that shows different different solutions to common problems. The next one is the one that I'm working on. It's energy and climate management in modern buildings. Um, in my view, that's a problem that we hear all the time. People struggle to make modern buildings energy efficient, to keep them cool in the summer and warm in the winter. They don't meet energy codes that we currently have oftentimes. Um, they're sometimes viewed as being energy wasters, and we've assembled uh, actually 10 case studies of projects um, where we feel that people have done a good job uh, of upgrading the um, mechanical systems, improving the temperature for the occupants, but also done it within the framework of good conservation practice so it doesn't ruin the building and it maintains uh, important aspects of the building. So for the future, this case study series will cover topics like conservation planning and adaptive reuse. We may do another concrete volume, modern houses. We're thinking about plastics uh, and so on, so on. So these are our, this is our idea. We, we'd, be, we'd love to hear um, ideas about what you think, where we could be uh, useful and provide case study books. It was definitely, um, we often hear that case studies are, are in demand. Academics like case studies because they can use them for coursework and people in the field like to see what their peers are doing. So case studies are um, very useful and that's what we're gonna focus on. In, uh, in terms of other publications, we do a lot of bibliographies. And um, we've done two already, one on concrete, re readings on concrete, and one on modern materials. And these bibliographies are an attempt also to sort of package information. We feel like in the age of Google and the internet, you can find lots and lots of information about technical topics. But we've tried to sort of curate things and make sure that these readings are, are good and they're not ridiculous or far-fetched or possibly even damaging practices. So we're trying to uh, put forward things that we think are, will be useful. And there again, there's, a, there's utility to, to academics and to researchers for, for this kind of information. And uh, finally, we're gonna do a little bit of work in the near future on architectural plastics. This is an area that hasn't seen much r research, but it's a big, um, modern buildings contain a lot of plastics, mostly as finish, surface finishes, uh, but there's plastic everywhere, and um, only, uh, it's not a, a popular topic. At the Getty Conservation Institute, we've been looking at conserving plastics in art. Um, late, like artists from the 60s and 70s were using plastics and acrylics and all of these things. Um, so we're gonna apply a little bit of that science to plastic laminates and plastics that are used in, in architecture. So that's an upcoming area of research. And uh, finally, I just wanted to talk about um, what brings me to Ahmedabad. Um, we, as I said, we have a project in Chandigarh, but this is actually, I think, our third visit to Ahmedabad. And, um, you know, we, we were interested in Chandigarh for the obvious reason that it has this sort of modern pedigree, but so does Ahmedabad. And we feel like there's an amazing uh, modern heritage here. 
not only in the works of Le Corbusier and Louis Kahn, but in the works by B.V. Doshi and Charles Correa. And um, we're very interested in what's happening in, the, in, in efforts to conserve uh, places here in Chandigarh. And um, in t 2018, we were here, we did a, we did a, a panel or a, a workshop. Uh, as I mentioned, Le Corbusier designed uh, only three museums in his lifetime and they're all more or less the same building. Two of them are here in India, and one of them is in Tokyo. And he had this concept for the Museum of Unlimited Growth. It has the central courtyard and some idea that you could expand it. That never happened in any of the cases, but it's interesting because to see this sort of same building appear in three completely different contexts, is quite interesting. So we brought together representatives from these three museums. We spent three days in Ahmedabad, and then we went up to Chandigarh. And well, we wanted to introduce the people to each other, and we wanted to have them share their challenges, because in, in fact, they do face many of the same challenges, because they're dealing with a very similar building. And yet they are all very different. The museum in um, the National Museum of Western Art in Tokyo is like a, a you know, well-funded, uh, expensively maintained museum with a, a, with a collection of, of uh, art, artwork on canvas. Um, it's very popular. They've expanded it three times, I think, since it was originally built. And the museum in Chandigarh is, as I described, it's a, it's a building in good condition with a very good collection. It has a very small curatorial staff, and um, they, they want to do the right thing, and they're reaching out and trying to get help. And then there's the Sanskar Kendra here, which is a, in poor condition and doesn't really have a very interesting collection, and it has quite low visitation. So as much as we wanted the three museums to kind of get to know each other, we also wanted to sort of demonstrate to the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation or the people working at the museum, running the museum, the sort of possibility that that building uh, could, could have by looking at the two others. And um, the, the, the director, we had a, a really nice moment, the director of the National Museum in, in, in um, Tokyo, Mr. Murakami, after the first day we met here in Amenabad, we, we visited Sanskar Kendra and we were asking everybody what were their reactions today. He said, I felt like I've just met a brother I never knew I had or something like that. I mean, the buildings are so similar that they are, there's, there's a family resemblance, you could say. Um, we tried, so the, we, we wanted them to discuss their issues. We wanted to talk about what's individually significant, but we also had this notion that the three together have some sort of collective significance, that in fact the, um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. These three create an ensemble of buildings that should be looked at together, and that actually the Sanskar Kendra is part, oh, sorry, is part of something bigger than itself, and all three of them are, are interrelated. So, and we talked a lot about um, of these things. So, you know, we're quite concerned about the museum here. Uh, we we talked about um, the significance of of we identified significance for Sanskar Kendra. We talked about it being one of five of Le Corbusier's buildings here in Ahmedabad, one of the three only museums that he ever designed. Uh, it's links to the history of the city. It was considered to be the city museum at this moment, 1953, when Ahmedabad was becoming the modern city that it is today. This was meant to be a cultural center for the city. Um, and it has very high integrity. It has been changed very little of all three museums. It hasn't been changed hardly at all. And so it is actually quite uh, authentic. And on the other hand, um, it has some fairly serious vulnerabilities as well. It has a low visitation. It has a very degraded landscape surrounding it. And um, the mission of the museum is unclear. There's very little staff working there. And the collections are at least 
in 2018 when we were here, they were quite worn out and um, they didn't seem to be engaging the public at all. There's, they had a very low visitation, very little footfall as, as we say. Um, we noticed exterior concrete elements were deteriorating um, an incompatible use had been added at some point an election office had been added and the toilets were the plumbing was seeping into the concrete and all so um, this project is I would say is somewhat imperiled and um, so we we are continuing to be worried about it um, and then the other and we held this three-day workshop of ours at the mill owners building, which is another building that we're quite worried about. Um, this building has a great deal of significance as I, similar to the other one. It's one of the five buildings by Le Corbusier. Um, and it is a symbol of the Ahmedabad's textile history and the philanthropic mission that the mill owners, um, the, their history of philanthropy and the organization and what it meant to the city. It's been influential on Indian architecture and on the associations with Indian architects. I should have said so does Sanskar Kendra. B.V. Doshi worked on that project and he worked on this project. He was in Le Corbusier's office as you know and it has its own history and associations. So we feel it is a very important building um, but we feel it has extremely high number of threats that uh, make it perhaps even um, at a higher risk than the Sanskar Kendra. Um, there are only four mill owners remaining in this association that owns the building. There used to be 64 mill owners, and obviously that's, that's a result of the changing uh, economic conditions and the changing roles of the mills, but they don't have sufficient operating funds. We've been working with the general secretary who runs the place, and he tells us that they He's trying to rent the space for uh, exhibits and events and so forth, and he's made a contact with architecture schools, and things are happening there, but they don't have, an, they're not getting enough funding. Um, but the real threat is from the surrounding, uh, from development and real estate pressures. It's a small property, and it's a small building on a large parcel in an area of Metabod that's being developed very rapidly. There are very tall buildings going up all around it and it's fairly, fairly likely or it's possible that the site would be sold uh, because the land is so valuable and it's, it's not protected. Um, none of these modern buildings are protected in any way. So um, I just point this out because it isn't really something that GCI can solve. This is a local issue and preservation and conservation has this component. We talk a lot about the technical components and the materiality of buildings, but this is also an important component of, of uh, conservation uh, are these issues where you have to um, sometimes uh, get vocal and, and make a lot of noise and try to save buildings. And it's, it's not something that we as outsiders can do. And uh, I know it's a very difficult task, but we are worried about especially these two buildings. But we acknowledge the modern heritage in Ahmedabad, this campus, uh, the, the, um, the IIM and the building, all of the work of Le Corbusier makes it a pretty amazing place. And we would hate to see these buildings lost. And actually I visited the mill owners yesterday. It looks better than ever. And it's, it's not an issue of material conservation. It's in good shape. It doesn't appear to have any problems. But it is it is absolutely threatened, I would say, um, as much as Sanskar Kendra. So that's that's the end. I have a, a summary of all these things that we've done just for the sake of boasting. Um, but we're not doing this to boast. We're doing it to try to provide some assistance. And, and please look at the look at the website and some of these publications and hopefully you'll find useful information that will help you as you are in your stu studies and also as you move into the profession and practicing. Um, we're hopeful this will be uh, good information that you can use. Okay, thank you.
interesting insights. Is this on? Yeah. And especially on the Ahmedabad buildings, uh, I'll just like to um, add a couple of things when you said that people have to be vocal. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, or it was a three years ago, there was a, a group of architects mm -hmm. who went uh, one evening and stood in front of Sanskar Kendra when there was a new building, a taller building proposed very close to Sanskar Kendra, which was supposed to be, I think, a AMC building, uh, yeah, a substation, which was right in front of Sanskar Kendra. And there were a large group of architects who went there and yeah. they sort of signed a petition and they stopped the construction of that building. Story. So yeah, so sometimes we end up. Yes, yeah. So sometimes we do end up yeah. in crowds. <laughs> but um, about the... Um, about the protection status as well, um, I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think INTAC has listed these buildings. Uh, they have listed, but they are to be yet legally notified. Uh -huh. So I think that process is pending. Uh, and that also has a lot to do with, because a lot of these buildings are privately owned. The municipal buildings can be easily legally notified, but the privately owned building buildings are difficult uh, because it has to go through certain. Yeah. So I think there's some, uh, some. And I have a feeling in the Case of the they may not. Yeah, exactly. To be legally protected, and I, I'm uh, afraid a lot of campuses may also not be okay with it. So I think there's a uh, there's a there's that story as well. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for bringing out the threats to these buildings. Uh, if there are any other questions, that any any questions, additions, yeah. I'm extremely impressed by the investigation and monitoring protocols and i'm telling this in sep because uh, we are also planning as you know the conservation of our fa building mm -hmm. and uh, especially to the campus office that monitoring and investigation before we start patch repairs or even large scale repairs are essential as uh, you're very well demonstrated like three years four years uh, i'm not saying the same amount but i think uh, and i hope that we'll be able to have such rigorous uh, protocols in this campus at least. So I look forward to your assistance and of course Jigna will take care of it uh, yeah. in the process that we follow here. <laughs> well, I, I could say that um, the, the Borough Charter is, is our guide and it, in, it includes a, a very basic methodology and it always starts with understanding the building and it doing investigations before you develop the solutions so if you don't understand what the problem is you can't come up with a good it's always the case yeah no it's always the case and you don't always find a a building owner who has the patience to let you do investigations and work out solutions. So it's it's always a struggle. Yeah. yeah. And you you're not gonna be getting away with by saying Jigna will take care of no, you. No, you're part of us. So Jigna will take care of being Well, uh, thank you, Mr. McCoy, for uh, the presentation. I wanted to ask that uh, in case of modern buildings, um, and when we compare it with the rather older buildings, I think building materials and building technology has also uh, kind of become more complex. Um, so I did see that uh, when you all when you all had those meetings, general public was also in, was a bubble in that group of four. I just wanted to know that does Getty also work in building capacity? for the con conservation of these modern buildings, uh, non-architectural like capacity, considering the complexity of the materials that are like, well, being used? Um, we, we do. We actually have a, a tr education and training is one of the things that we do. I, I must have forgotten to say that. Um, and we try to do, we try to build capacity. We have a we, we started a couple of years ago with this three-day course on introduction to conserving modern architecture, and we're going to develop a, f a four-week course. And we, we're always targeting uh, practitioners, people who are either architects or conservators or building owners. But yes, it's very important to us to, to 
build capacity among uh, our own our own um, peer group and uh, among professionals. So we we try. I mean, it's hard to we we do these training classes and we only reach 25 people and we do it three times. So we don't have a very broad. Uh, we have to under, figure out how to broaden our our reach, I guess. But we're trying. No. So, uh, sir, in the example of the TW airport, where it was converted into a hotel. Mm -hmm. So it's a public building. Uh, so how do uh, we take decisions when we? Uh, have to propose to adapt to reuse. So, how, what can we consider? What are the points that we can keep in mind? Uh, because when, in case of private, uh, private buildings, the residents or the other users have the voice. So, when taking decisions for public buildings, what are the considerations? Well, ad adaptive reuse is perhaps one of the most c complicated, but it's also the most frequently done of, of any of the uh, treatments. Um, so, you, you know, you frequently have to make a trade-off. If you, if you can't keep the building in use, it will be torn down. So you have to f think of a way to make it function. And so you sometimes have to make a trade-off between protecting architectural elements or character-defining features or elements that are significant with that need to change the building. Um, so it's a careful balance. You always want to make sure you don't go too far because um, you don't want to ruin the building in the process. So it is, it, 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 it is, a, it is a design skill, actually. Um, I, I think it's something that should be taught in architecture school on, on a very regular basis because, as a matter of fact, most architects end up working with existing buildings even if they think they're going to be always designing new ones, they never do. And learning how to do that and respect the historic building uh, and allow for new uses is is a is a skill, and it's not it's not easy. Uh, there again, you start by kind of identifying what's the most significant aspect. In the case of the uh, TWA terminal. Um, Obviously, the old use was completely impossible. It just it didn't work anymore as a as an airline because the way air traffic has changed, and now there's all this security and screening, and none of that existed in the 1960s when they built this building. And the difficulty with this building was everything was formed in concrete, like the ticket counters and the luggage handling areas, and it was almost impossible to change. So they couldn't have really reused it as a as an as a for for uh, as a terminal anymore, so they just had to completely think of something new. And in fact, it works pretty well as the lobby for a hotel. And um, so, I mean, I think that's kind of an extreme example. And then they build a sort of C-shaped uh, structure behind it, which contains the hotel rooms. And some people don't think, or some people are quite upset about it because there's this big addition to it now. On the other hand, the alternative would have been tearing it down. I mean, an airport authority doesn't have, is not a very sentimental agency. They don't care. And, um, but in the case of that, it was the, in, in the city of New York, there were a lot of people who loved that building and saw that it was a significant work of architecture and they made a lot of noise and they went to the commission hearings and they sort of forced the airport to behave itself and luckily, somebody came up with this idea. Um, otherwise, probably they would. It would just be an empty, sad building with no use. So, um, yeah, it's it's probably it's not only are there these difficult technical issues, but the concept of reusing is is a very complicated issue and requires a great deal of skill and careful thought. I just want to know if um, GCI focuses only on architectural conservation, but does it also take projects that involve historic landscapes? No, not, not yet. 
I mean, only insofar as they are associated with uh, architecture, like with the Eames House. But no, I mean, we have a lot of things already that we're trying to to do, and I guess that's just a little bit too much. But we don't. But it's good that you have an interest in landscape architecture, and there is always a relationship between the building and the landscape. So you're frequently confronted with landscape issues, even if all you want to do is renovate a building. You always have landscape somewhere. Um, hello, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, different uh, sites, heritage sites, they call for different approach from conservation architects. So, uh, uh, so what according to you uh, will be the best approach uh, to document a site? Uh, and I would also like to know what uh, Getty Conservation Initiative uses as a procedure. Like for, for documenting? For documenting. Well, actually, I don't think there's any difference between the way we document a modern building or an archaeological site. I mean, we use all manner of drone photography and laser scanning and all sorts of technology um, that has sort of transformed this whole area of documentation. But actually, I don't think we have anything, we don't do anything different. These technologies are so good and they're so effective, they, they work everywhere. And um, I, I think maybe we maybe document a certain detail, level of detail perhaps in a modern building. Like with maybe the Eames house, for example, we, we get somewhat m microscopic in our view of that building. You wouldn't do that on a university campus. So it's sort of the scale of what you document is related to the size of the building or complex. Did I answer your question? You would still look like, yeah? Um, it was a very interesting session. Uh, I was just curious to know a little bit more about on-site challenges, like challenges during the execution of these projects. Uh, do you face any problem in getting skilled laborers or executioners who can, I mean, it's one aspect to propose the repair work, but to be able to actually do well, that. Well, that's a very can good question. Can you share some experiences? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, it is very difficult to find skilled craftspeople who know how to do this kind of work. and. Um, and there are only a few, like in California where we work, there are a few, uh, for example, companies that specialize in the sort of concrete conservation and they have very good skills, um, but it's, it's hard. Um, even finding people who can do traditional skills like repointing bricks and, I mean, it, it might be easier here in India, in the US, it's like, Traditional skills are vanishing and nobody has the skills to, to look at modern stuff because they never learned it because it hasn't really been taught. So it's, it's a very challenging um, aspect of this whole thing. And then there's the issue of these modern materials that are no longer produced and you have to f constantly be looking for substitutes. And that isn't something you have to do when you're working on a traditional building. You'll always be able to find bricks or slate or stone or mortar, uh, but you can't find fiberglass corrugated sheets or semesto or vinyl. I mean, there, you know, these things are, have very short lifespan in terms of the way they, or many, you know, the things are popular and they, they're trendy and then they stop being popular and then they disappear. Uh, so it's, it's also very difficult to find substitute materials for um, if, you're, if you're really wanting to tr try to create an authentic uh, substitute. So yeah, both are challenges. You mean like to do, a, to do training for 
craftsmen or people who work in the trades know. But that's a good, a very good idea. Um, yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, Dubai uh, city is uh, lots of modern architecture in building. Yeah, as for example, Burj Khalifa and uh, whatever. And uh, the India is uh, poor in modern architecture in technique or uh, building. So what reason behind this, Dubai and India, why these are two are not same? different kind of things. Uh, I, I don't understand your question completely. Okay. I repeat that. Dubai city is lots of modern architecture in building. Mm -hmm. As for example, Burj Khalifa and at whatsoever. And uh, in India, there's a lack of things behind modern architecture. In mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the reasons we're interested in what's happening here, because there's actually quite a bit of significant modern architecture in India. Obviously, it isn't the first thing you think about when you think about Indian heritage. Uh, and in terms of the greater picture, the, uh, you know, the ancient temples and the archaeological sites and all of these Mughal palaces, that's sort of the the thing you frequently think about. But in fact, India has a, a very significant modern heritage. And um, we just don't want that to be forgotten. It's part of the story of India's history. And all of this modernism is part of the story of post-colonial India and the nation of India. So we, you know, we think it's quite an important period. It's an epoch that was very important to the formation of India. And so we're just trying to raise a little bit of awareness about this and um, so that it doesn't get forgotten. There have been a few instances where some significant buildings were, were torn down and, or we see buildings that look like they're badly neglected. And so we just want to make a point that this is important work and shouldn't be forgotten. <clears throat> Um, sir, my question is in continuation to what you just answered. Um, so it is easy, like comparatively easy, to convince people on conserving the uh, buildings that were done maybe 600,000 years ago. But how do we, how do we convince people to conserve th something that was maybe just 75 years mm -hmm. old or 50 years old? Um, one of the things that comes on the top of my mind is giving incentives and maybe taking uh, some stake in that building because mostly like many of the buildings that we saw like Milona's or Sanskar Kendra, they are partly privately uh, owned. So how do we, uh, if there are any examples that you've given, give, you can give or maybe what you've come across, how you have convinced uh, stakeholders to conserve a building that is not very old. Well, I mean, I, I think I should say this is this problem that you're describing is true everywhere. It's not just that India has. I mean, I think for most people, heritage means something that's at least a hundred years old and maybe five hundred years old. And even in the U.S., which is much younger country, it it's a very hard idea to to convey to people. Um, however, the 20th century was an important century, just like the 19th century and the 18th century and the, the prehistoric times. And if, we, and if we don't protect evidence of the 20th century and some of its finest work, we'll, be, um, we'll have lost some part of our, our culture. And um, I know it's a hard argument to make. And, um, and funds are always scarce, and they usually 
um, is a battle to get m money to pay for these things. So it isn't at all unique uh, to this country. It's always the case. Um, and your question about how do you make incentives, I, I don't know. I mean, every country is different. Um, in the US, there's actually uh, a, a tax incentive where if you give, if you invest money to restore a historic building, you'll get a tax credit on your income tax. That's a very American kind of a solution to a problem. And people will do anything to pay less taxes, and so it, but it works. Um, I don't know anything about the tax structure in India if a, or if a thing like that would work here. Um, perhaps not. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there again, that's a more, I mean, I think the solutions have to be worked out on a more regional or national level. There's no, there's no magic answer and it's unfortunately it's a problem everywhere and people will always be biased towards the older heritage um, and that's just the way it is however I mean you know that's like I was saying we can't we can't ignore the importance of the 20th century it's the 21st century now and everybody is charging into the future but let's not forget uh, the past and in and some um, really great architecture and cultural heritage is residing in that in that work so um, you know in the case of a privately owned building I it's that's the hardest one of all because if it's a publicly owned building you can talk to the authorities and you can show that there are people who care like the example you gave at Sanskar Kendra um, in a private building it's it's much harder sometimes um, and even it's probably the case here in the US you can't designate a building as historic if the owners object to having it designated and uh, I suppose that's probably the case here as well so it's it's not easy I never said it was easy and so but I mean you know we do the best we can I, I don't know so All right, you. thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is a very engaging yeah. session as well. Um, I think there's more talking to the our side. Ah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Oh. I love taking it. <laughs> Especially getting it at the end of my trip. Thank you. It's a very small thank you for the yeah. So yeah. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I will thank CIA and CAC, which is us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for organizing. Thank you.